Ben's disappointment. Unemployment soon followed. Now he's trying again. And we recorded this interview just before the start of his new show on late night TV. With us on Signature, David Letterman. What was your reaction when you kept hey, reading? What was your reaction? <laughs> when you kept reading and being told David Letterman's no good at 10 in the morning. <laughs> what a miserable way of phrasing it. Um, no good at 10 in the morning? Heavens, it makes me sound deficient somehow, doesn't it? Uh, well, it was painful, of course. Um, but then again, when you're involved at the being on television at 10 in the morning, you think that uh, the entire world is staring at you. But uh, as it turns out, 10 in the morning on television is uh, not that important in the grand scheme of things. But then again, what is? Uh, where was I? Um, you were also said to have a high, quote, uh, likability quotient. Okay. I have a high likability quotient. Well, not having worked in a year, I find that hard to believe. If, if I was uh, that highly likable, it seemed like there would have been employment coming my way. Um, I never heard that I had a high likability quotient. Do you do? Oh, thank you very much. And so do you. <laughs> I was getting at <laughs> I've been is, looking through your dossier, and you're very likable. What I was getting at is, is how television tries to quantify and explain things by this jargon survey and market. Uh, analysis. Yes. Yeah. All of which came up to say that David Letterman's show had to go off the air. Well, it got to be uh, uh, just a matter of mathematics and business. We had started out in the, uh, on shaky ground, and it got shakier. And by the time we recovered, we had lost uh, numerous affiliates, the number of which was actually too great to, for us to overcome. Uh, represented in ratings, if that makes any sense. So uh, while we were being rated in Boston. Uh, we didn't do well in Boston because we weren't on the air. Nonetheless, we were still rated there. And this happened, we ended up losing about 40% of the markets we started out with, and uh, then it became tough to improve the overall rating. So it was, a, it was an easy decision to make for them to take the show off the air. And by them, I mean NBC. You were a weekend weatherman in Indianapolis. And still am. Four years later, you had your own network. Touching a network is like touching a power line, though, isn't it? It was exciting. It was something that I had always wanted to do uh, uh, when I was younger, which was uh, before now. <laughs> um, uh, I always uh, had dreams of coming to New York City and uh, working for a television network. It seemed very exciting, and it was exciting. I enjoyed it a great deal. Did you feel any way double-crossed by the network that yeah, that was lousy. <laughs> no, um, no, not really. It was, uh, you know, it's uh, everybody knew going in that it was uh, a long shot, and uh, I knew, and the the wonderful people that we had working on the show also got the feeling that it was a, a chance to, uh, you know, roll the dice and see what we could come up with that would be different from uh, daytime programming. And uh, no, I didn't feel double crossed. I f I felt uh, like I got a really good education as to the way things work in network situations, but I didn't feel double-crossed. Wait, wait, wait. How do things work in network situations? Um, you may be thinking you're having a discussion on a topic when in, actually, when in actuality you're being told <laughs> what to do. You're not discussing it. You're being told what to do. And you sit through a couple of those, uh, and then you realize who really is controlling the strings. Was that a surprise? was a surprise to me. I had not experienced it firsthand, you know. I had always heard uh, the stories about, oh, the network won't let us do that, and the network won't let us do this. And uh, this was my first brush with it. And fist fights ensued. Can you give us an idea of what they wouldn't let you do? Um, it was not so much what they wouldn't let us do as to what they would rather we did. Uh, and it, w it, it would always come down to the same issue. Um, NBC did research and... Uh, wanted to see more daytime-oriented features on the show. And that's what the discussion was generally about. That, that again, sounds a bit like jargon. What is daytime-oriented? Well, uh, there, uh, my feeling was that if you did something interesting, uh, that it would be interesting to whomever was up, regardless of the time of day. Uh, NBC, and I don't mean this to be uh, denigrating them, they felt that uh, you should do features that would be interesting to women, older women. They wanted the features on uh, makeup and nail care and so forth, which I'm not against. 
Um, but I felt like you should probably expand your area of uh, interest and, and, and people would follow you. That's what I thought. I was wrong. <laughs> would you like to do another network show of your own? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would like to do that. Well, how would you prevent this from happening again? I'd, I'd probably have to do it in Taiwan. <laughs> uh, I, I think that I have learned uh, uh, a little bit about the art of compromise, and I think that, uh, that I probably would not get into another daytime situation. So I think with those two things in mind, I think I would ha stand a better chance. Plus, you learn from your mistakes, and hopefully you don't make them again. Looking at you from a distance, and let's do that, shall we? Trying to switch gears. You really seem like um, a comic of, of true talent, kind of in search of a personality or an identity yet. If you say Johnny Carson, we know just what you mean. If you stay, say Steve Allen, we know what we're going to get. How do you see yourself as, as a performer, as a comic? Well, I, didn't, I never started out as a comic. Uh, that uh, became necessary later. I started out in uh, radio and TV. And uh, I moved to Los Angeles, and I realized to get to the level that I wanted to get to, I was going to have to become a comic. So it's, it was, for me, something that I learned to do. And by comic, I mean somebody who stands up in nightclubs and makes drunks laugh. Uh, and, and I'm not really very good at that, because it's not really what I like doing the best, but it's something that I had to learn how to do. So. Um, I think my uh, true identity or personality is, is more somebody who just uh, hosts a TV show as opposed to, I'm not Shecky Green. <laughs> not that, that there was any confusion on that point, though. I brought that up only because at one point I read where you said that it's really a question of personality. That's right. I not think the so. material, but it's That's really right. the person. Anybody who is successful. Uh, in stand-up comedy, Steve Martin, Bill Cosby, Richard Pryor, anyone who is good at it and, and makes huge sums of money at it, uh, their personality always is the most important thing. The material is secondary. You, you like the person, you, you like how they handle themselves, uh, you sense some vulnerability about them. Um, Steve Martin's material, if you gave it to any other adult human probably would not work. Uh, but because of his personality, you accept him, you like him, and, and you'll play along. And that's what I'm hoping you'll do. Just play along, will you? Where does that something come from that makes you funny? I mean, your father was a florist, your mother was a secretary. Mm -hmm. Where did you come from? Um, where, you mean, where did I come from? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Not, neither one of them. Mom's not funny. Mom's just as, as dull as a wrench. Uh, but uh, what does she think about you in this business? Oh, she doesn't. You know, it's like she thinks I might probably just this close to being a circus performer. That's what mom thinks, you know, <laughs> uh, and, that I hang out with midgets and so forth, which I do, but it has nothing to do with the profession. Uh, I just keep them around the house. Uh, I think a lot of people do. Um, and my father uh, is, being dead, of course, is less active than he once was, but he, <laughs> where were we? He, he was funny. He was, he was funny. I mean, is there a need for you to make me laugh? You? <laughs> or the audience? Uh, n n no, not really. Why do you do it? Oh, geez, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, you know, um, I don't know. That's, uh, you do what you do, don't you? I think you do. Thank you. Drive safely. I didn't ask that to, to be facetious. It's just, it's such a unique thing. Stand up and say, all right, folks, I'm going to make you all laugh for the next hour. It's, it seems like an impossible task. For me, it is. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to somebody like you who essentially takes your identity from being a television personality without a television show? Well, um, you just, um, some people, uh, can make furniture, so they make furniture, and and some people uh, can make people laugh, so they do that. You know, it's I, I don't think it's all terribly mysterious. I was just talking very personally. How do you get through your days? I mean, 
isn't it what you really want to do is be on television? Yes, I would like to be on television. And you're not on television. This is not on television. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, how do I get through my days? Um, like most of us, pills and whiskey. <laughs> it's just uh, it's all, about all you can do anymore. Do you write? Uh, I try to. I, writing is the best, best way to come up with material. And, uh, but I, it's very, uh, I'm undisciplined in that regard, and it's, it's tough to actually just sit down and, and do it. So I do less of it than I should, yeah. You showed up in Hollywood from Indiana. Yes, sir. The weekend weatherman now in, Indi in Hollywood. How'd you get your start? What'd you do? Well, uh, initially, I, st I thought I would be a writer. I thought that that's what I would uh, do from uh, local television, and, and found that uh, be becoming a writer unsolicited is uh, virtually an impossibility because what you find out is everyone has written a script, uh, a screenplay, a play, and uh, there is a huge public warehouse in Los Angeles <laughs> where all of these scripts end up. Um, it's a, a municipal code. You have to surrender them once you cross the boundaries of the city, and y it's impossible. Uh, what I found out you could do, however, was go to a, a, a comedy store, or the comedy store, and, and uh, perform on, on a Monday night, uh, and there people would at least see you. So that's what I started doing almost immediately, was going to this place. And you'd never done that? You'd never stood up in a No, in fact, I hated it. I, I loathed it. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm still not fond of it. It's uh, uh, a difficult thing to do and a very uh, embarrassing thing when it doesn't work. So uh, I had never done it before and avoided it. And, and, and television was sort of an insulator. It kept, kept you, you could perform without being in front of a lot of people. So no one wanted your script, so you start acting <clears throat> or doing these shticks in a little amateur nightclub. Right. And then what happened? Uh, from that, I got hired. Uh, Jimmy Walker, who was, a, uh, was on a show called uh, Good Times at the time, uh, hired me to write jokes for him. And it was a very generous thing for him to do. And I, I wrote for him for about a year. And in the meantime, I started getting jobs writing for television shows. Uh, so it's not an impossibility. Um, again, the, the key word is unsolicited. If you just show up with scripts, they could care less because everybody has a script. Um, through Jimmy Walker, I got an agent, and the agent would then send me around to various jobs, and you would interview for them. Do you think it's ridiculous for me to think that if you truly have talent, one way or another, even in a jungle like Hollywood, you'll get seen? No, you're right. You are right. Uh, yeah, it is true. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it never happens overnight. Um, but no, you're right. Overnight? You, it happened to you in less than a year. I mean, how fast do you want it? Uh, well, it depends. Again, we're talking in degrees of, uh, I was lucky because within a year I got employment doing what I wanted to do. But I'm still looking to, uh, you know, it was five years later and you're out of a job again. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, you started writing, then uh, walk me through this. Then suddenly you get on Carson. How does one do that? Oh, uh, that's, um, I don't know, it may be interesting to people, but it's a pretty standard route uh, for comics. Uh, the Tonight Show, an appearance on The Tonight Show, is about the best forum, best national television forum. And it's a uh, highly desirable, uh, much sought after oh, situation. I don't know that. My question is, how'd you get there? Uh, you continue working at, at these clubs night after night after night, and you develop a relationship with the various talent coordinators in the city. And uh, when the time comes, you mutually agree upon appearing on the show. They are the best show. That is the best show for comics in that they won't put you on if you're not ready. They don't want a guy to come on and do four minutes and never be heard of again. Uh, so they actually kind of baby you through the process. And they'll say, uh, you got a great five minutes, but you're not ready. Uh, six months later, fine, you're coming along. A year later, you know, you'll do the show. And that, it was much like that for me. Uh, at the time, I was working on the Mary Tyler Moore Variety Hour, uh, which didn't last too long. It lasted about uh, three weeks. And... Uh, but ready seems to be the word. So many young comics say, if I only got a chance, if you only put me on, I'd make it. That isn't true, is it? No. No. I'll, there, um, you talked about earlier, uh, 
the influence of television, people come to Los Angeles, go to Los Angeles, and uh, feel that if they get six minutes of comedy ready to be on the Merv Griffin show, then they'll get their own situation comedy. And it has happened. Uh, it doesn't happen often. Uh, now, the other school of comedy is uh, the old school where, by gosh, I'm going to entertain clubs, uh, Elks groups, uh, holiday inn parties uh, for the rest of my life. And these guys are the guys who are out there fighting it. They, they'll work anywhere, and they're in it for the long haul. But again, it somewhat happened to you. You did it six minutes on Carson, and then you got offered a fat contract from NBC in your own show. Were you ready? Well, it didn't actually happen like that. It, uh, at the time, I was doing a pilot uh, for NBC, and then I did The Tonight Show, and then uh, from that, the most important thing that came was I started hosting The Tonight Show. And after the hosting, that's when uh, I felt like I had, had taken a significant step. And, and from that point on, uh, the daytime show came about. That was a lot of money. For me, it was a lot of money, yeah. Does the money, you're still receiving the money, although you're not working. <laughs> that's right. Does that that's do you any good? Well, I can afford a swell shirt like this. I see you dress for us. No, it's not. I mean, uh, it's distressing. I, the, to be out of work is the, um, you know, that takes the edge off everything else. You would rather be working regardless. And I, you know, I do work. I still work these little clubs as much as I don't really like it. And uh, I do The Tonight Show frequently. And I do other little projects. So I am working in a sense. But I would really, after having the experience of a, a daily show, you would rather, I would rather be doing that again. I guess I was getting it. Frequently, the networks will, in effect, tie up a bright talent like yourself, <laughs> pay you a lot of money, and say, we'll find something for you to do somewhere along the line. Right. Would you accept such a deal again? Uh, no. No. The only reason I accepted this one was I felt like um, after the show was canceled, NBC said, uh, don't worry. We're going to get you back on the air. And I thought, well, that's great, because I would like to go back on the air. And, and plus, when the show was canceled, the people that were working on our show were wonderful. And, and I felt badly because there was about 40 people or so who really um, helped shape the personality of this project and who looked forward to coming to work. And uh, it was the best working conditions I've ever been in, you know. And so I felt sad that we were all out of work. So I thought this would be great because we just, we take this and we move it into another and it didn't happen. It went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so I took the, this particular deal because I, still in the back of my mind, I thought that uh, with a gr without a great deal of trouble, we could rekindle what had been working so well. But you had one shot of your own show. And for all a variety of reasons, it still goes down the record books, it failed. The next one is it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that it's it. Uh, it's, uh, I, you know, I thought about that. I don't think uh, the next one, I think the next one will be a success. And um, I think largely the first one was a success. So I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not really. That is ironic, isn't it? Your first one, at the time you were canceled, the ratings were going up. The audience was responding. Yeah. Were the advertisers happy? Oh, I would guess not. <laughs> I would guess not. They were selling a fade cream, <laughs> age spots, uh, things to make that disappear, and some sort of goiter ointment. <laughs> I don't think they were happy, no. But nonetheless, in the books, it said that it <laughs> didn't work. If I were you, I'm just saying, I would be a bit squeezed over that next show that I took. You think so? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to let that bother me. It's a long way back to Indianapolis, though, isn't it? It's about, I guess, 800 miles from here. Well, it depends on where you're from. It's about 2,200 from L.A., about 800 from here. Could you ever go back? I go back, uh, and I like going back. It's fun. It's a neat little, uh, actually, it's not such a little community. I don't know that I could ever live and work there again because of the uh, bad check situation. But <laughs> No I guess what I really meant, once you've tasted this, what do you do? 
Yeah, it's, it spoils you. Like I said, having your own show uh, five days a week, uh, working under those circumstances is uh, pretty desirable, and uh, anything less does not satiate one. Where does David Letterman fit as an entertainer? I see myself maybe as being on TV again, but uh, I don't know. I, I guess, I, you know, it would be nice to be uh, uh, like an S.J. Perlman, where you're just an ongoing entity. Uh, I guess that would be desirable, but I don't know that you can do that anymore. Maybe, you know, I mean, I guess he could do it again, but I don't know. Do you notice when you talk, your hands are all over your face? I know. <coughs> I'm, I'm very nervous. Why? Uh, I think it's an enzyme deficiency. I think it could be corrected with some sort of uh, nutritional guidance, but uh, <laughs> I don't know why. I'm always like this. It's certainly not you. I mean, Lord knows you've been wonderful. Um, <laughs> I think I'm just nervous all the time. I'm never, I'm never really relaxed. Are the jokes really a cover-up for the, for the nervousness? No. No. I, th I think it's, um, no, I don't think so. I get the sense when somebody starts questioning you or at getting close, I notice you always counter with a joke. Uh, you know what that is, oddly enough, if, if you do it long enough, there's a rhythm to it. And anything that sounds like a setup, you then feel obliged to fill in the punchline. And, and so that's what that is. <laughs> Most of what I say sounds like a setup. Well, uh, most of what anybody says sounds like a setup. You had it to do all over again. Would you do anything different? I mean, starting from Indiana and heading to LA. Mm. I say this for all the 25-year-old would-be comics who are watching you right now. Yes, yeah, and stay where you are. Don't go out there. Stay out of everyone's way. <laughs> There's too many of them, too many uh, talented, funny people uh, afoot. Uh, sure, I, yeah, I think anybody would do it over. Who do you know who wouldn't do it again, with the exception of maybe... Uh, no, that wasn't the question. What would you do differently? Oh, what would I do differently? Uh, I guess the way I always wanted to do it was go to New York first. I would rather have come to New York than go to Los Angeles, because that was always seemed a real desirable thing to do, and still is, seems desirable. And um, maybe I would have done it a couple of years earlier. Well, that begs the obvious question. Why'd the bus go to L.A.? Why didn't you come to New York? Because at the time, you had to go to L.A. To do what I wanted to do, you had to do it. You had to go to L.A. Uh, ten years earlier, you would, you would have to go to New York. And what about today? Uh, today, you have to go to Sioux Falls, Minnesota. <laughs> well, you are in New York with us, and David Letterman, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. There was...